So we're going to look at the integral from 0 to infinity fx dx. So we call this an improper integral. Uh, <clears throat> this integral converges if it is a finite value. So we'll say some number k in R. And it diverges if it's either uh, infinity or does not exist. So this was all chapter 8.7 in your calculus book. Uh, the way we saw these, we did lim b approaches infinity, integral 0 to b, fx dx. So hopefully you remember something like that from improper integrals. So we just took the infinity endpoint, turned it into a b, took the integral, and then at the very end applied the limit. So we're going to determine convergence or divergence of three different integrals right now. Some of these are going to converge, some of them will diverge. So first, 0 to infinity, 1 over 1 plus x squared. And next up, 0 to infinity, 1 over 1 plus x and last integral 0 to infinity 1 over x dx all right so find these antiderivatives I'll give you a hint the first one is an inverse trig the second one is natural log and so is the third figure out these antiderivatives. So I am skipping a step on here. I'm integrating and dropping a limit at the same time. <clears throat> All right, what's the limit of tangent inverse of infinity? No, it's not undefined. Pi over 2. So this is tangent inverse right here. Comes from the tangent function, but you swap x and y. So if we go forever to the right, you're going to approach the horizontal asymptote y equals pi over 2. So keep going to the right. You hit that. So we got pi over 2, and tan 0 is right there at the origin, is 0. <sighs> All right, so pi over 2 is not the answer. What are we supposed to, what answer should we be writing down? Converge. So we got a number, doesn't have to be a nice number as long as it's not infinity or negative infinity. 
uh, this will be converging. All right, so next one, we have uh, 1 over 1 plus x. This is going to be natural log. So our limit b approaches infinity, ln 1 plus x from 0 to b. ln of 1 is 0. So what is the limit of natural log of infinity? So on your somewhere in calculus 2 cheat sheet, ln of infinity equals infinity. So that first one is infinity minus ln 1, which is 0. So we get infinity. So what is our answer to part 2? Diverge. All right, up for the last one. <clears throat> so this one is slightly different than the other ones because we have vertical asymptote as well. So we have vertical asymptote at x equals 0. So we have to split it and let x approach 0 from the positive side and um, go approach infinity on the other. And what I'm going to do is break it at 1. So we're going to have infinity 0 to 1. 1 over x dx plus integral 1 to infinity 1 over x dx. So I just took x value of 1 and split it into two separate areas. Right above we already determined basically that the second one would diverge even though it's slightly different function but it's very similar. It's just a horizontal shift of 1. That's the only difference between these two functions. So the areas will be a tiny bit off, uh, but what I circled will still be infinity. All right, what is it? Anything plus infinity. There's a couple options. Infinity is one option. Uh, you can't get a finite number out of this, uh, or zero, or negative infinity, or does not exist, or the other two options. So as soon as you get infinity, you can say it does not converge for any one of the pieces. So that infinity means does not converge. So just same thing as diverges? Yeah, I don't know why I wrote it does not converge. But that specific thing is what makes it, I wanted to emphasize the not part. So that the fact that we had that infinity there is what made it diverge. So I'm going to write some useful limits down, which are going to be a little bit more tricky. And you're going to notice a lot of e to the x show up. And if you're paying attention at all before, you sh saw e to the mx show up quite a bit in the other parts of this class or e to the integral of f of x or p of x or however we call the integrating factor. So it's not a coincidence that exponentials show up all over the place. So our first limb, x approaches infinity, e to the negative sx over s is 0 if s is greater than 0. Next limit, e to the negative sx over s squared also equals 0 if s greater than 0. Next limit, x e to the negative sx over s equals 0, if s is greater than 0. And our last special limit, so 
all these require s to be greater than zero, and the last one, n, can be any power. So now we have a theorem if integral zero to infinity e to the negative sx times f of x dx is a finite number. The way we can write that, if it equals k, where k is a number in r. So everything I wrote on the board means that this integral converges, because it is a k uh, value, which is a real number. So if this converges, for some s equals s naught in R, then it also converges for every s greater than s naught. So we're ready for the Laplace transform. So this is a definition. Uh, so I'm not going to prove this theorem, but let's just look at it for one minute here. What happens, so if you know that this converges for some s value, so what I did is just highlight the s value there. Let me get a better color, we'll go yellow. All right, so let's look at that s value. What would the value of this function, how would the value change if s was increased? Now it's negative, so if you increase it, it's going to be a more negative power, but it's negative, so it would really be a reciprocal. So it actually makes your function smaller with a larger s value. Or think of it as a larger negative exponent is probably a good way to think of it. x won't be negative because we started at zero, so x is basically positive. So the fact that s is larger and larger means the function value is smaller and smaller. That's why it converges. <coughs> so ready for our little plus transform. So you have to apply it to a continuous function whose domain is zero to infinity. And of course, outputs real numbers. So we write it like that. So it's a continuous function, domain zero to infinity, range is some real numbers. So the Laplace transform is L of f. It's actually a function of s. So it's the integral 0 to infinity, e to the negative sx, f of x, dx. And L of, s, uh, L of f is a function of s. All right, just from the definition, where in the world does x go? How? If I look at this integral, how in the world is this not a function of x? What happens after you take your integral? What happens to all these x's? So they'll be replaced by these. So there should be no more x's in there. However, s is not an s antiderivative, so s is going to survive. So there'll be an s in there, just no x's anymore. So that's how your function of x turns into a function of s. Uh, some places you're going to see L written in some weird cursive way. It kind of looks like this. L of f. You can write it however you want. It doesn't matter to me. Just make sure your L doesn't look like a 2. So I don't think it's two, 2 f's or something like that. 
So we're going to find the Laplace of some easy functions. So this will be some easy examples we can compute. So I'll get you started on the first one. Uh, let f of x equal x. It's one of the easier functions is the identity function. Find L of f. So all we know is the definition. So it's integral 0 to infinity e negative sx times x dx. So I just replaced f by the function x. How do we integrate this? So step one, I'm going to change improper integral the infinity endpoint out for a b. And I'm going to write it as x e negative sx dx. Uh, so think way back to calc 2, what do you need to do to find this antiderivative? It's not trig sub. It's not partial fractions. Integration by parts. U sub would have been a reasonable guess, but U sub won't work out this time. Gross. All right, so go with integration by parts. <laughs> All right, I'll write integration by parts in case you maybe forgot. So you're basically switching where who's who has the derivative. So it switches off from being derivative of v to derivative of u. So I'll give you two minutes for this, because it may have been a while. You can work with your neighbors if you forgot. There's no way all of you forgot this. All right, u has to equal x, and dv is e to the negative sx dx. You have to find regular v and find du. I'll find du. That's super easy. It's just 1 dx. So you have to find the antiderivative e to the negative sx. I'll give you a hint. It's got e to the negative sx in it. There's just a coefficient you need at the front. You can always guess and check. Plug that back in to your integration by parts and finish this off. You integrate the dv. 
so your coefficient's going to be negative 1 over s. Then we take the derivative. The chain rule will cancel that out. Oh, we take the derivative of that. You take antiderivative of dv. And then... Oh, dv. Where's dv? Oh, I'll deal with that. Okay. Is that the right V? Yeah. Something like that, yeah. For the Alright, is that right for the antiderivative? I think it should be positive, so you get the, oh, wait, the, no, oh, that guy should be positive, making this one negative. There we go. Okay, so any questions on this Calculus 2 stuff? So I know the antiderivative, so I'm going to use that right here. Lin B approaches infinity. I'm using the antiderivative on the bottom left. So now I'm plugging in 0 and b. What variable is getting the 0 value? Shouldn't your e to the sx be in the numerator? Uh. Yes. All right, so are these s equals 0, or is that x equals 0? x. How do we know it's x equals 0? Yeah, so this is the variable you saw in the integral right there. So the integrals x limits b. So it's a little tricky because there's two variables playing slightly different roles. So make sure you're plugging the value at the right time for the right uh, variable. All right, so just plug in b, plug in 0, subtract. This is the easy step. So plug in b for x. So we have negative b over s e to the b Nope, S E to the S B. Minus one over S squared E to the S B. Now plug in zero for X. <coughs> the first term is zero. The second term is one over s squared e to the 0, which is just 1. All right, so that's a lot of work. Now we got two tricky limits.
So let's look at that first limit. Now I gave you special limits a minute ago. So let's look at your special limits. I think I did them with negative s powers, but we are using the first and the second on different parts. So these are both going to go to zero right here. So there's. Can we just assume that s is going to be greater than zero? Oh uh, yeah, I don't think I wrote that anywhere, but you always assume s is greater than or equal to zero. It's the only number that we've actually defined between zero and infinity is x so far. Yeah, s is always going to be um, zero or more. I believe. Although I didn't write that down in the definition. That is not in the definition. Let's not worry about S for right now. All right, let's get back to our limit. <clears throat> All right, so our first limit here, it would be written as, let's see, s doesn't matter, so it's negative one over s. I'm gonna swap back in x for a second. It looks like this with x's in instead of b's. So I don't think that's not the first easy limit. I think that's actually the second to last special limit right there. But the point is, it still approaches zero. The next one is that s squared limit. That was the second special limit, also approaches zero, right there. So we get this whole thing turns into zero, zero, zero minus zero minus zero, plus one over s squared, which is one over s squared. So if I summarize all this, l of x is one over s squared. That's what we computed, the Laplace of the x function. Uh, well, f of x is x, so this is l, this is l of f of x, like that, however you want to write it. All right, so now we're going to look at other properties of a Laplace transform. So L is a linear operator. You saw that before, what linear operators mean. So that means L of alpha F plus beta G is alpha L of F plus beta L of G. So linear means it splits up over addition and constant multiples. Uh, the Laplace transform is a function and it is a one-to-one -one function. What does being one-to-one -one actually give us? What can you do if you know your function is one-to-one? -one? So what do we call that? Yep, so function one to one, you get inverse. That means if you uh, normally would think of x and y values, but if you know the output, you can recover the input. That's what one to one means. Uh, so function, so property one means that if f1 is equal to f2, then L of F1 equals L of F2. Now any function has this property. That's not really a big deal. Uh, the second one's way more of a big deal. So one to one means if L of F1 
is equal to L of F2. F1 has to equal F2. All right, so we saw that 1 to 1 means there's an inverse. So L has an inverse. L inverse of F is the function such that oh, I better use two different F's for this so we'll go capital F is the input for L inverse and then L of little f is supposed to equal capital F uh, if I write this out in function notation that I prefer, it looks like L of little f equals big F, and that would be the same as little f equals L inverse of big F. So this is moving the function to the other side right, with the inverse. So that should be the same moving the function to the other side that we always have. Uh, also, L inverse is a linear operator. That means L inverse of alpha F, capital F, plus beta, capital G, is going to equal alpha L inverse of F, plus beta L inverse G. So this linear property goes both directions. get into 27C. I'm going to make a new page for this. Port Z. Port Z. And we'll just type it this time. So we're going to look at solution of linear ODE with constant coefficients using Laplace transform. So we always start out with the easiest version and then make things more difficult. So our linear ODE is an y nth derivative plus an minus 1 r to the n minus 1 derivative plus a1 y prime plus a0. We're not going to assume this is homogeneous, so we'll put an f on the other side. And then, of course, we can write it as summation k equals 0 to n ak y k derivative all right what we're going to do is apply l to both sides so i get l of this summation
All right, so first thing, Laplace operator is a linear uh, operator, so I can push it inside the sum and pass the constant. Or another way to think about it in this notation at the top, if I take L of the whole thing, I can basically distribute L to every piece inside. So it looks like summation equals zero to N, AKL of YK derivative equals L of F. All right, so I'm going, we're going to use this a few times, so let's label it with an asterisk so we can refer back to it quick. So we'll consider one of these at a time. So we're just going to consider one of these L of YKs at a time. This is integral 0 to infinity e to the negative sx y k derivative dx. This is inside of the Huh? This is inside of the time. Nope. It's just one of those terms. What I underlined, I'm just writing out what that is. Oh, okay. So I'm just considering one of the terms at a time before we go and sum up all the results, basically. All right, so what k value do you think would be the easiest to think about? Zero. So have no derivatives, so we'll think about that one first. We got one k is zero, L, just L of y, and that's integral zero to infinity, e negative sx, just y, dx. Now if you don't know anything about y, there's really nothing you can do to this. So I can't, there's nothing fancy I can do if I don't know any details about y. So that's about as good as it's going to get for k equals 0 for now. You're writing s is not 5, right? I have not written a 5, okay, that's probably right. all class. Uh, when k equals 1, we get L of Y prime integral zero to infinity E negative SX Y prime DX. So we're going to do integration by parts. That may seem a little bit weird. What would be a good thing to call what I underline? Y prime DX. That'll be DV. So u is going to be a leftover, e to the negative sx, dv is y prime dx. The reason this is great, what's the antiderivative of y prime? y. Oh, look at that. So we just lost our y prime right there. And du is negative s e negative, uh, negative s e to the negative sx dx. So making the substitution, we got 0, 2, oops, right, integration by parts. So it's uv minus integral v du. So uv is y e negative sx minus integral v du. So we have negative, which is makes our negative positive, s e negative s x, y, dx. All right, any questions on that integration by parts? That s is constant, so I'm going to bring that out to the front. All right, this should look familiar.
Yep. You oh. see that? Yeah. So let's go ahead and write it as y e negative s x, and then we have s times l of y. So it's plus s l of y. Well, that's pretty nice. And what we're going to do is do the next uh, higher degree term, and basically you're going to get pretty much an s squared. And then cube, you get a cube, etc. So we'll do the next few, and then look at the pattern, and then write the general formula.